Hello, everybody online. Thank you for tuning in to our second repeating topic for monthly photography and videography session. Today's topic focus will be on big animals, anything big animals underwater, whether it's being captured by video or photo. We have all these awesome speakers today joining us to share more about their uh, amazing work underwater and how they manage to capture such big animals with uh, frame with the right frame with the correct lighting and also what are the seasonal migration pattern and many more so without further ado i am carter i'm the host and moderator for this panel and today we have diego from canada he is a uh, trusted in the world of tv and handle underwater camera and whisk away a 12 episode travel show across Southeast Asia and he has at least 15 years of experience. So uh, Diego has uh, his main th his main focus in, is on um, videography and he'll be sharing more later. And next up we have Amos, our next panelist, a very uh, very very professional and experienced underwater photo photographer who has captured many many big animals as well um, from whale sharks white tip sharks blue whales crocodiles and even polar bears i think i saw his picture in many magazines and i have interacted with him before uh, in in other cases uh, and he's from israel okay thank you amos thank you diego for coming online next up we have renee renee is from usa she has been diving remote parts of the world. So I believe her big animals and her picture will be very, very um, exclusive. Okay. Um, and last but not least, we have Jason. Jason is from, he's, he's from Britain, right? Yeah. And um, he co-founded underwater film and photography company called the Scuba Zoo. I believe uh, Jason has came to ADEX before and we have interact each other with each other physically before and um, he's a very friendly awesome guy which I've saw some of his work before and without further ado I don't want to hold up um, the session I'd like all the panelists and speakers to share their great work so first up we will have Diego to share and talk more about his big animals underwater Diego over to you please thank you very much yeah big animals um, obviously obviously it's uh, an awesome topic I had to bring out the big guns because the panelists are uh, some really top experienced people here. So the biggest animal that I've been fortunate to have an interaction with was a, was a blue whale behind me. Um, and it was very much the pinnacle of my, uh, my diving and my, my filming career, really. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, getting to that point um, and, and um, you know, getting to a point where you are, you're comfortable with the camera and you have confidence in your skills and your abilities um, to deal with this kind of situation when you're in the wild with, you know, just an animal of almost like unfathomable size. So, so I mean, about me, um, maybe we can start the first video. I thought it would be maybe nicer just to see um, my reel a little bit, uh, some of the, some of the just random kind of shots that I've, that I've taken over the years. Um, so go ahead and start anytime uh, you can there, Alphonse. Um, so for me, I mean, my if, if you guys don't know me, my affiliation with ADEX goes back quite a ways. I was the um, editor of uh, Scuba Diver Australasia for many years um, and even uh, Asian Diver magazine for a few issues. And uh, yeah, I was afraid of this. It doesn't play very smooth, but uh, anyway, it gives you an idea and I'll just, I'll just kind of talk a little bit more about myself and my background. Um, so my, my first experience with a large animal was actually, uh, you know, when I was learning to dive, was, was like many of us, nurse sharks. Um, and for me, it was in Belize and saw, you know, massive whale shark shortly after that in Honduras. And I had amazing opportunities to see the thresher sharks in the Philippines. I'm sure many, many of you guys out in Asia have seen that. The mantas and, and uh, molas in Bali. All of these kind of experiences um, you know, really just um, blew me away and just kind of like strengthened my passion for the underwater world. So at that time, I wasn't, I wasn't really a photographer or a videographer. It was something that I kind of eased into um, through, my, through my work in television. So a lot of my background is actually land-based producing and directing. 
And so my, my efforts to, um, to further my career in television opened up these other opportunities for me. Um, so I just wanted to say that because like it's, I think my path to this is sort of non-traditional and I, unlike the other panelists, I'm not really a stills photographer, uh, not, not really at all. I haven't been for many years. Uh, so I, I've you know, been focused on, on video and um, I've been very fortunate. So, so for example, you know, some of these scenes you've seen the, the Crocs, um, Mexico, I had the opportunity to film for Discovery. And, um, and I even you know, had an amazing experience filming um, for National Geographic Australia in um, Africa with the whale sharks off of Toko, Mozambique. Um, so, you know, I guess, you know, it, it really wasn't until I started working at Discovery Channel in Canada where I started to get regular opportunities to get in the water with large animals. Um, so, you know, for example, you know, the hammerheads of Bimini and, and uh, the crocs, as I mentioned, bull sharks and tiger sharks, and there's, you know, belugas in Canada. Um, so I have, you know, I had this sort of tremendous, um, really good luck with, with um, the opportunities that I've been given. Here's a scene we filmed off of Mexico with the whale sharks, with the biologist Rafael de la Parra uh, putting a tag on a whale shark. Um, just one of the one of the many stories that I did for Discovery in my time there. So I guess, you know, I know there's a lot of kind of questions about the technical stuff. And for me, like with video, I don't know about uh, I don't know about Jason or you guys, like what you guys think, but I always feel a little bit more kind of like my choices are limited with video, unlike with photos. Like I, I'm, it's just like you're kind of you're kind of locked into um, the sub like the subject matter and generally speaking when you're shooting video underwater if you have the ability for example uh, let me just sort of explain what i mean if you have the ability to shoot 60 frames per second that's generally what you want you want to be shooting slow motion right 4k beautiful image raw image if you can right um so but that has this sort of cascade effect on everything so um so for instance, the, your color space for me, the technical aspects of it is I'm just going to go with the native, whatever the native color space is on the camera. I'm going to go with the native ISO on the camera to try to get the highest, highest quality video that I can out of whatever camera I'm using. So I, I don't feel like, you know, there's not a lot of wiggle room there for creativity. Um, and, and generally with video, you, you want it, you know, it's not often like if you're working for, in my case, working for commercial broadcasters, you don't want to like, get artistic you know what I mean you don't want to be like shooting it shooting it like darkish or like you know what I mean it's it's you always want to kind of you don't want the viewer to be kind of wondering and asking questions they, you just want the viewer to be experiencing it and that's what your executive producers are going to want the bosses in television are always going to want so that's what I mean you don't have a ton of options so anyway uh, if you're shooting 60 frames per second for instance you have to be shooting like 120 for your shutter speed right it's just one of those rules, um, double your frame rate. Am I right, Jason? Am I getting it? <laughs> Pretty much, yes. <laughs> it's a rule of thumb. It's kind of like, a, it's a well-known rule of thumb. And, and every time I meet with a DP, they're like, this is, they, they tell, this is what they want. That's what they tell you. Um, and it's all about really, at the end of the day, creating a smooth image, the highest quality you can get with the lowest noise and the darks and so on. Um, so, Anyway, once you've got all that kind of locked in, what are you gonna do, right? Your aperture, you can play with your aperture, you can play with, with NDs, um, but for the most part, you're, you're, you don't have a ton of wiggle room. You just wanna get a nice, a nice clear image. Um, now I know that there was questions off the top of like how to light and where to position yourself. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but like ob obviously if you can get in a situation where you have the ability to make that kind of decision, but when, in the case of this amazing whale encounter, for instance, there was no, there's no opportunity for me to say, oh, I'm gonna position the animal here or there. I'm gonna jump. The animal is, you know, is in the distance and I'm floating in the ocean. It's gonna to swim towards me, to the side of me, left or right, below me, or it could just do a 180 for all I know, right? So, so I mean, I think that in this kind of case, it's, it's rare that you get the opportunity but for this particular shot with the blue whale, obviously I was just lucky to have um, a clear day and, and relatively you know, flat waters to be able to generate an image. So th this image is, is taken from video, from 4K video. And it was shot with a Panasonic GH5 or a GH5S. Um, and I, so I just extracted the still frame and it still looks you know, really, really clean. 
one of the things that kind of I would never have kind of been prepared for uh, because, you know, this was like the one and only close up experience that I've ever had with the blue whale. The, the, but what I, you know, never would have imagined or, you know, just clearly hard to predict kind of situation is what, you know, when the animal's coming in, it's, it's so difficult to understand its, its size um, that, you know, you're, you, you lose tons of light. So like if I position myself, you know, right in between the animal, you can see the tail is overblown and the tip of the, the right at the tip of his little lips there, it's, it's almost underexposed. So the animal is so huge that it's ranging in, in, in throughout the column and you just, you're gonna lose light at any moment. So in a lot of cases, you know, you just wanna play it safe is my, is my point. Um, and so that's what I do. I play it safe as much as I can um, because so much can really go wrong. <laughs> And uh, maybe I could chat a little bit about things that have gone wrong for me. There's a long list. <laughs> but I think, you know, it's when you talk about like preparing and, and, and it's a, to me, it's all it's about learning. Right. And you only like I have learned by really messing up really badly. So, for example, my first day of filming for a television show, you know, 20 years ago now, I think it was. Um, my very first day in the field, we're diving. I'm a dive master. This is like great. I'm gonna be operating a camera, getting paid. And uh, where's my mask? Uh, <laughs> my mask just washed away in this crazy current that came through. It literally like like was you know around my arm and just got pulled away, gone. And it just so happened that we had left whatever the backup gear on shore, or, you know whatever. Just just all those little things. So so. Some of those things are just like, you can't, I can't even go into the to all the details of how many things can go wrong, right? On my last, my, I had a rehearsal uh, a couple weeks ago uh, for a film, different thing. Um, but, you know, I, I misplaced the, the cap to, the, uh, to where the plunger goes in to get the vacuum seal. <laughs> just that little cap, that little piece can ruin your whole shoot, right? Um, and that's that it ruined the rehearsal basically is what happened. So, I mean, these, these things happen and you learn from them. And so what I, my advice, you know, for people who are starting out is be prepared to F up, you know, you're going to make mistakes. There's going to be nonstop mistakes and, and really the, 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 the test to, to success will be how you deal with it. You learn from it and, you know, can you pivot in the moment as well? It's huge. Um, and that goes beyond exposure and all those technical things that we talk about, right? It's just, it's just, it's life, but it's also, it's life underwater with camera equipment. It's maddening. Um, so, okay. Uh, why don't we play the, the next video here? And uh, this is just a little teaser of a story that I did with uh, Amanda Cotton, uh, who is, I believe, one of Amos's guides or uh, one of all of our dear friends, a uh, wonderful photographer, and um, she basically invited me out to film her adventures with the crocodiles in the Banco Chinchorro of Mexico. So we'll just play that little um, teaser if you can, uh, Alphonse. Hundreds of crocodile attacks are reported every year around the world. But underwater photographer Amanda Cotton isn't afraid. I think a lot of people think that the minute you go in the water with them, that they're going to try to eat you. I like to, be able uh -oh. to show that that may not necessarily be the case. Is she risking too much for the ultimate shot? I definitely want to get some nice close up shots. This isn't her first rodeo. Amanda's a seasoned pro, known for her nerves of steel. For me, for my photographs, I'm really trying to show a different side to the animals that I'm shooting. So normally I'm out shooting sharks, um, Humboldt squid, other animals that have a misconception about them. I'm looking for the next big animal to dive with. So yeah, that was a, a fantastic experience filming with, with her. She's, she's, you know, so wonderful. Um, I, at that point in my career, you know, I... Um, the camera wasn't like always my, my big, my biggest sort of responsibility, right? We always had sort of cameramen who were, who were there and I would generally be a producer director. Um, but in this case, I, I, you know, felt like I wanted to take the plunge. And so one of the lessons that really Amanda kind of 
helped me to, to get over was the, the fear. And I, I think that's something that when you're dealing with big animals, even if they're like, you know, harmless, like this blue whale, it can be, you know, for me, <laughs> extremely terrifying. And it's something that I wish people had kind of spoken about more openly, like when I was kind of learning and, you know, you, you're hanging out with like film crews and photographers and, you know, these top guys. It is absolutely terrifying. For the first time you see an enormous whale, wh shark, whatever it is coming at you in the ocean. Um, and as, a, as an image maker, as a camera person, you're, you're gonna have that experience as well. And I think for me, it was a, it was a huge challenge of uh, uh, trying to control that fear and trying to, trying to live with that adrenaline that comes through your body. Um, and it ruined more than, you know, one shot for me, the fear, the kind of shakiness. Uh, but eventually with, with time, with, with um, the right people, you kind of learn. You learn that that fear is most often, you know, in your mind. Um, most often the animals are not a threat to you whatsoever. And so, you know, you kind of learn to rely on people like Amanda Cotton and, and Amos and, and Jason and people who have done this, you know, for, for who do this on the daily. Um, and so as a, as a camera person, you kind of like, as a video person, you kind of like drop in on these, these different locations and, and work with these experts, featuring these experts, and you learn from them. And so um, I was always so grateful for that experience and all the experiences I've had where I have relied on experts who have shown me that there is no danger. And, and so when I was able to see this enormous whale, even though my heart was pounding out of my chest, I was able to just breathe, calm, get the shot. Once the, fit, once the animal had moved out of frame and I was happy with my shot, um, the adrenaline overwhelmed me. And I have to say, I went back to the boat. I was shaking with, I mean, excitement, fear, adrenaline, everything. Um, and, and that feeling is now like what I'm always after again. As much as I'm after an image, as much as like I want, you know, to have a great shot, it's really about the experience and, and that feeling. So make sure that you enjoy it. That's all for me. Who's next, man? All right. Thank you, Diego, for all the wonderful video and explanation and sharing. Uh, next up, I would like to have Amos to come and share more about his big animals. Um, Amos, please. Okay, somebody can uh, raise the images, please. Yeah, all right, shortly, the images will be up. Um, Al France is preparing for it now. Okay, so I can start with the fact that uh, everybody to know or not know that I've been doing big animals for 45 years. I started the concept of big animals a long time ago. And it started basically from the concept of the idea that I was diving before and leading many trips into the wonderful blue water of the world or reef of the world from the Red Sea to Papua New Guinea, Indonesia and Philippines in the 70s and 80s. But I saw the damage that we caused at the time to the reef around the world, other from the number of people, the both or anchors. And I decided that I could not continue anymore. And in 1988, I sold the company that I had running trip around the world for just for recreational diving. And I took two years um, absentee from diving in reef and I worked with searching for Spanish galleon and then came to the idea, I wanted to continue to work in water, but work only in blue water and only with big animals. And my experience with the big animal was positive from the beginning of a long time. And the idea then around the world was a fear. And I learned that the enemy of all fear is experience and knowledge. So one of the first things I did is the animal that considered to be the most dangerous of them all for many different reasons, either from religion, either from, the, either from media, either from the movies, and diving with a great white. I'm not sure that the picture, the next picture is there, but this picture in particular is of a great white and great white smiling and I'm outside of the cage. I'm not in the cage. And how do you do that? Well, 
it is combination of a lot of experience and knowledge perhaps and, and gathering information. And during the Great White, I did since the eighties in Australia with the famous and the, one of my mentor Rodney Fox, and then taking some of this knowledge into South Africa together with another mentor, great friend of mine till today, Andre Hartmann. And we tested different things. And the idea the, the, which all the great white till today happening with charming the water and then baiting the water and they, when the shark come in, take the bait out of the mouth and the shark get crazy and everybody get happy. But that's not the shark behavior. That's not the shark being. What to do is to find out when is their peak time to be with the animal. Every animal have a peak time to be with it. You cannot force them into the picture. You can. So as a commercial operator or as an operator on my own, I don't work for Geographic. I don't work for BBC. I don't work for anyone. And I will not take the work. I work only based on my own desire and my own direction and my own speed and my own place around the world. And pick up just the peak time of the animal behavior and go there. And rather to put chum and bait in the water because the animal is there already, in this case, the great white, there is no problem getting out of the cage because they're there. Not just they're there because we are in the cage and this case picture taken in, actually in, in, um, in uh, Guadalupe, we are lower the cage down to about 30 feet and our tank and the cage moving in the current the shark hear it. And the shark in October, November, which is the peak time, they will come in just because they are wondering what's happened around there. They're curious, but they are not aggravated. And I go out of the cage and I put it in front of me and perfectly buoyancy control. And this is how I train the people, only perfect buoyancy control, otherwise nobody diving. Stay only at 30 feet together with me by the level of the cage and take one person at a time to swim with the, with the great white. And it shows up. And in particular, in this case, I'm, I don't know if the picture is there. I'm in the front of the camera. I'm in the camera. And I knew that I'm going to do it. And what I did, I did some, OK, here's the picture. Bravo. Here's the picture. And I'm at the picture taken by Jeff Collis. You see his credit on the bottom. And by the way, every time you use other people, picture always put their name on it. This is a copyright. Otherwise, it's violation. And I'm here especially because the idea that I have in mind, how do I share this experience with other people all around the world, the seven or eight billion people that believe that the shark is going to kill you? And I put inside the camera only one lens that hardly anybody used today. I put a 50 millimeter lens. And why? Because a 50 millimeter lens is a normal lens. She see exactly the same angle as our eyes. I wanted to bring a picture. When the people see it, it is like them being in the front of the shark. If you go back to the next picture, you see the shark is smiling to the camera. If you can bring the picture back from, this is a 50 millimeter picture, three feet away, one meter. It's not cropped, it's not chopped, it is nothing. It is the way it's taken in the camera. This is how a great white look at you at three feet away on a 50 millimeter lens. This is a big animal photography. You understand the animal. You don't charm it. You don't attract it. You don't make it do something different. You let it, you let, we have to be with them, not them to be with us. And if we want to be with them, we need to understand their behavior, understand their timing and work with them, create a harmony in the wilderness. I may be considered one of the most dangerous person in the world. And I've been called like the dangerous person in the world. And I never had one accident in the water. And none of the people that were with me. I took 400 people swimming with a great white in open water. And none of them ever got hurt. But there are more great white got hurt hitting the cages. And I was kicked out of Mexico because I'm swimming with a great white out of the cage because other operators cannot do that. And I, it was considered dangerous and no danger because I make an effort to understand and safety is number one with any animal. Let's go to another one. We speak enough about the great white, which they are amazing. We go into the Marlin, Marlin in um, Mexico. 
uh, in uh, Baja California, in the western side, out of Magdalena Bay. Uh, the best time of the year is uh, November, December. And many, many, many people out there, many. There is tremendous. When we were last time, not just we were there, even what the Sha Sha Saudi Sheikh with his big boat, his helicopter and chase boat <laughs> and run away after a day or two, it is not easy. It is not easy. But if you know the timing and you go for a week long or two weeks long and you spend and you go there for eight hours to be in the water, no matter how difficult, eventually you get the picture. Many people take, and it is, I would say a hundred people almost on a, on a weekly basis out there. But to take a picture like that, it is a time understanding the animal behavior and how you get the full scale of less than three feet in front of me. I'm here with a lens of the Nikon 14 to 24, open 14 millimeter lens. And you see the whole fish in the front of me as the seal come in and the marlin come in the front, but only I have only four people on the trip with me and only two people at a time. We don't put everybody together. Try to move away from everybody else and to do the thing that, that if I was a National Geographic photographer BBC, that's what I'll do, but I will do it on my own term and my own time and my own places. Next time when we go there, everybody go and run on a boat for who knows how long I go there on a liverboard dive boat, a catamaran only with three people. One of the epic moment or the epic moment in my career today is to be the first photo still photographer uh, to photograph polar bear underwater. That there are 12 people landed on the moon. Over 4,000 people summited on the Everest. Only five people ever to swim with polar bear underwater. All four of them are for filmmaker. And the, for the, today I'm the only still photographer that been diving with them. And there, unfortunately I did not know we can put movies or, or video, but there was a movie made about, uh, about my career and also about the particular diving with the polar bear um, film that was photographed by or filmed by Adam Ravitch, great friend of mine, that uh, we were together and we went out there to photograph the polar bear. Now, yes, polar bear is dangerous, polar bear are difficult, polar bear, polar bear, polar bear. Everybody knows the story. What we did was something that hardly anybody can imagine. First of all, we learned where the polar bear, now they need to swim more than ever before, and especially in the summertime because less ice. And we went to some place that we cannot disclose out in Canada. And we went and stayed there for almost, according to budget, only five, five or six days. And we were lucky eventually the last day or the day before last to be able to capture them. We saw the polar bear coming out from one island. They go on the island and they had to continue into another place where there are birds on the rocks because that's what they feed during the summer. If there is no ice, there's no ringed seal, they're going to feed on the eggs and the birds on a, on a rock. We knew it. And as they came out of the second island and they had to cross the water, Adam and I, they put us, uh, the boat put us in the water and we saw them from a distance from 200 yards away. Adam and I stayed in the water. We were trading water for about 40 minutes. Cold water, we just traded water. We let the polar bear see us. We did not move even an inch toward them. Let the polar bear see us all the time and they swam directly at us at all the time. For 45 minutes, the mother saw us all the time. Her head was out of the water and she saw our heads and she came, she could go 360, 359 degree and she missed us altogether. In one degree, I could not see them left and right. She came directly over our head. And in this picture, as you see, one of the young ones was swimming toward me. About 15 years ago, I had the first time attempt to dive with a polar bear. And a polar bear dived after me, or I had to run away from it, and it was diving to, after me to about 75 feet. What happened is I was on a boat. I was searching on my own. Other people joined me. 
and they were not very well organized or very well or very good diver, I would say. And when the one of the diver, the the buddy that's supposed to be with me, went to the water, he lost the tank that was attached to his BCD. So the crew had to help him to come back on the boat. I was in the water alone with a polar bear. I had to make a decision what I'm going to do. Either I'll go back to the boat, camera, 35 pounds on my weight, tank on my back. Can I swim fast enough to the boat? I go diving. I went diving and the polar bear against all the law of physics and all the expectation of researcher and scientists that polar bear cannot dive more than 10 meters. This is what the report by other filmmakers. But because of the body weight and the fair, but the polar bear was running after me to 75 feet. I remember that very well, yeah. <laughs> but I knew I could do better. And I convinced a friend of mine in Israel, Jonathan Neer and Danny Menkin, they are film producer, and they decided to do the story about my life. And we went back to the Arctic and we were successful because of the teamwork. Adam Ravitch, Jonathan Neer, Danny Menkin, and the team of the Inuit that were our guides they knew the polar bear very well. So I always count on the local people around the world. I don't count on researcher. I don't count on, on National Geographic professor and the money they throw away. I look, I'll only work with the local people. They know better, in my view. I may be wrong, but so far in 45 years, it would be very right. So the local people, are, in this case, the Inuit were amazing. And the knowledge of Adam Ravitch, my knowledge, and together with the expertise in Yoni Dani, they make the movie. If you want to see the movie, you go online and the movie is a picture of his life and you can rent it and you can see it, you can enjoy it, 72 minutes. And talk about my history in life in Israel. And then of course, uh, the epic about almost 20, 30 minutes of the movie is only mostly about uh, diving with the polar bear and the history behind it. Uh, the polar bear just swam above, above my head. She came down to about 15, 20 feet away. She was like, in this case, I'm on a 16, 35 millimeter lens. I was about no more than five feet away. This picture again is full frame, um, but she just, this particular young one came, take a look at me and went back up toward the surface. Again, we let the polar bear swim toward us and about 20 feet away from Adam, in the front of Adam and I, we gave a sign to each other. We went down to about 15 feet and they kept going over our head. One of them came down as you see here and then continue over and totally in harmony. Next please. Well, what I can tell you guys, this picture won again. I was nominated to be <laughs> the wildlife photographer of the year um, by one of the competition companies. And this is picture taken long time ago in Antarctica um, of the leopard seals hunting the penguin. I know there is other photographer telling a great story about the leopard seals and how they entertain with him. I don't, I, in my experience, I don't give animals, any animals, human character or human behavior. I look at them as an animal and perhaps this one of the things that saved me till today and being with all of them and although I, considered dangerous, but <laughs> I, deal, I deal with it in a different way. So in this case, the leopard seals got into a shallow water, especially in the low tide. Well, I'm watching them for three years. I've been going to Antarctica many times. I've been there 15 times already. This will be the 16. And I watch them as the, how they behave, how they really hunt, because that's one of the key in my wildlife photography, and especially underwater and also topside, is the behavior of the animal. There is more picture of animals than animal in the wilderness. Think about it. There's more picture of lions and cheetah and tigers and monkeys than animal in the wild. But what they are, they are missing is animal behavior. And the animal behavior is the one that connect and make people passionate about them. And then we save them. So again, the leopard seal, he had to go to a shallow uh, lagoon put his head in the water during the low tide. And during the low tide, only the young chicks get into the water. Beyond the older chick or the older bears already know. So the young chick goes to the water and, we, and, the, polar, and the leopard seal put his head, it looked like a rock. It catch one of the young seal and pull it into a deep water. I took fin, snorkel, mask and camera, 
follow them and stay parallel to the animal, all the time parallel to the animal, never in front of them. And it hold it, he holds it the, 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 the penguin and let go. And then the leopard still running after it, catch it again, bring it back to the water and drown it. And that's the picture. I, there is no way to take it unless you stay with it, unless you leave it, unless you stay there. When you go to Antarctica, we'll go for three weeks, not go for seven days or 10 days just to see I was in Antarctica. That diving is, and photography is a study of behavior. Get deep into the environment. Many days, nothing happened. And you are frustrated. The weather, the condition, the animal. But when it happened, it is magic. It is hilarious. Like the guy before mentioned, the adrenaline rush, it is tell the whole story. And you stick with it forever. Like I stick with you now, and I do it for 45 years, and still go out again. And so the picture won, and the picture still co continue to be very popular around the world. And because it is the unique behavior, the authentic behavior of the animal without the human intervention that make all the difference in the world. And that's why it's so magnetic and so dynamic. Next. <laughs> of course, you also have to make fun out of the picture and out of the situation. And here, as the, as the leopard seal was actually pushing the penguin back to the land, back to the ice, and then he ran after it to catch it and bring it back in. It was playing with the penguin. And that is their ability. And that is the unique, the beautiful part of it. But it take only, I did not know that, but it took because I'm doing that again and again and again. And in my case, I can share it with the people who come with me or want to come with me. That's what you gain. That is the benefit from traveling with the, exp the expertise on the knowledge of some, like any one of you guys, or the traveling with me to get this kind of moment, understanding what happened, based on what happened in the past, what can happen, what to look for. Next, please. We talk about blue whale, we talk about the big animal, as everybody, most everybody knows the, the name of my business since 1998, <laughs> 1988 is Big Animal Expedition. I'm lucky that in 2021, uh, as a geographic called them, called them the, the, the meeting today, Big Animals. That's the name of the company that I carry for since 1988. And that's based on the dinosaurs. If Jason mentioned before, uh, not Jason, but um, um, the other photographer that was before, what we forget yeah. to say that this animal is not just a blue whale, is actually a modern time dinosaur. It is a dinosaur because during the period of the dinosaur, blue whale could not survive. It would be eaten very easily. But only after the dinosaur disappeared, blue whale could prosper in the world. 180 tons, 100 feet long, this animal could not survive on land. Only, in the, only water can carry it. And that is the blue whale, the majestic, majestic blue whale. But of course, everybody take picture from the head and from the, I don't know what, but the picture of the tail is seven meter wide, overlooking with a fish eye, is looking at the world. <laughs> and so animal, we don't have just to take the picture of the head or not just the, the body. We have to look at other elements of the world to bring it more to life. That's my view of it. Again, as a photographer, as a still photographer, that's how I look at my work. And I guess we have one last picture. And I'm so proud to say, and happy to say, that after all these years, uh, together with a friend of mine, with Marko Dimitrovich, one of my clients, we coming up with a book and called, not different than called Big. <laughs> and the book is not just about big animal, but big emotion. Uh, the book, uh, it is only today we finished working with the producer, is uh, the largest company in the world in uh, Germany that create coffee table book. Um, the book will be available, is available already on, um, on um, where is that, an Amazon pre-order, but the book will be ready in July. Uh, it is about the emotion 
that we felt as a photographer, Marco and myself, to wear the animal and what animal, what the emotion we felt from the animals with us in the water is all about harmony. And of course it starts with the blue whale, end up with the blue whale and everything else in between. <laughs> and there will be a shark, will be a croc, will be birds, will be monkey, will be uh, um, gorillas. You will be amazed. And the caption will be very light caption, only about emotion, only about the joy and the excitement of being in a wilderness. And thank you very much to be with you guys. Each one of you is remarkable and I'm glad to be part of it. Thank you for, thank you Amos for your awesome sharing. Uh, lo lots of uh, exotic animals out there, uh, especially the Arctic, the cold weather animals. Uh, time is a bit short, so I will jump to Rene. Uh, please share your amazing journey. Thank you, Carter, for the introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here this evening, especially um, to hear these really inspirational stories and see all of their work. And I'm kind of the new kid on the block here, so this is going to be a tough act to follow. Um, but I do have a few images to share from actually- You are a winner too. You are a winner too, <laughs> don't forget. <laughs> thank you. And actually, you know, I have to thank Amos because I actually went on a trip to Cuba with him and Amanda Cotton back in 2017 and really picked up some great tips, which um, I'll share with um, you tonight or today for some of you guys as well. Um, so my images are actually all from the island of Morea, which is a very beautiful island in French Polynesia. It's one of my absolute favorite destinations to visit, um, especially for underwater photography and especially for whales and sharks. Um, it's a year round destination for sharks and for whales, um, the, the peak season is September and early October. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. The first two images are from 2017. There we go. All right. So this picture of a humpback calf um, was taken, like I said, back in 2017. I was with my really good friend, um, Ron Watkins, and two other people and a great guide. And <clears throat> this was really my first real interaction with a whale underwater. And when we saw this whale, it was on the third day of our trip. and We hadn't really seen very much for the first couple of days. And um, at the time, the guide got in the water and she's swam out because um, she thought the mom and the, the testing um, at the bottom, which was about 100 meters, and the visibility, visibility there is really good. Um, so she could see them resting. And so she gave us the kind of arms up sign that it was okay to get in the water. So we went out and she um, told us where to be in the water. And I think that it's important to listen to the guides because they're usually very knowledgeable and, and know, you know where the animal will hopefully come up. And as we were waiting for, you know, the mom or just the baby to, to come to the surface, um, I was getting ready with my camera. So I was dialing in my settings. I was actually shooting pictures um, at Ron, who was next to me. And then I was shooting pictures down towards my fin, thinking that the whale would hopefully come up underneath where I was in the water. And what was really amazing about this experience is that the bubbles actually started coming up first. And I wasn't really actually sure what I was seeing and the bubbles were coming from the mom. And as these bubbles started to rise to the surface, um, all of a sudden the baby emerged <laughs> through the bubbles. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And its mouth was wide open. Um, it had its pectoral fins, you know, kind of out in front of itself. And it looks, you know, extremely animated. And honestly, I'm just lucky I, I pushed the shutter <laughs> because it was just the most amazing thing. And I couldn't believe that this is what I was seeing. And the interaction only lasted for, you know, maybe a few seconds. Um, I was able to get four frames of the humpback before it turned. Um, and, you know, it was definitely something that I think I would have missed if I wasn't ready for it. And I think that, you know, for people who haven't spent time in the water with whales, um, you know, it can be very, very challenging. Um, the conditions, it can be, you know, windy, there can be swells out there, you can be on a boat for maybe a week straight for eight hours a day. And, you know, you might not necessarily necessarily get time in the water with that animal. So if you do get time in the water with the animal, which you're really, really lucky to, to have, 
um, and very privileged to be in the water with it, then you know you really have to, to take advantage of it because you don't know how long it's going to last. Um, and this one was a very short interaction, but it stands out in my mind to this day, as Diego was saying, is just, you know, when I came to the surface, I had so much excitement and Ron and I were hot high-fiving each other and we were on the boat with towels over our head and we were reviewing the images, you know, because it was so bright so we could see them. Mm -hmm. And we had all this adrenaline and it was just the most, you know, amazing experience. <clears throat> and it's something that, you know, I, I, I treasure and I hope to have something like this, you know, again, another, another time. Um, the one thing that was, I guess, a little bit um, challenging is that the whale was not as close um, as, as, of course, it would have been optimal. This was shot at 24 millimeters on a 16 to 35, and it's cropped about 30%. So there's, you know, quite a bit of water between the water and the lens. Um, but I think under the circumstances, this was probably, you know, the best that, that I could do. And I was really like I said, very happy to, you know, capture this, this rare behavior, which I don't think is something that is uh, very common is from what my understanding is. Totally not. <laughs> Thank you. I've never seen an image like that. Uh, that's, that's amazing. Spectacular. Yeah, and I, I, don't, I don't think I'm ever gonna see something like that again. <laughs> so it was pretty amazing. Um, so then the next day, which was the last day of the trip, um, this was a different whale, actually. This was a different humpback. And this interaction lasted several minutes um, as opposed to just a few seconds. So this was actually um, you know, easier in terms of, of being able to get a little bit closer to the animal. And the animal actually approached us. And you know, the guide had told us, whatever you do, do not swim after the whale because you're never gonna swim as fast as a whale is gonna swim and you're just gonna scare it away. You know, or the mother is gonna take the calf and, and swim away with it. So, when we were in the water, the calf was actually very curious and it came over to us. And it was amazing to have this eye contact with the calf, um, which was um, something that I had never really had before either. And it was so cute because it was actually rolling around in the surface with all of the, the sargassum and kind of seaweed that you see there. And at one point um, it made about a 90 degree turn and its tail was right in front of my face. And you know, before I could do anything, I could feel this giant force of, of water coming and hitting my face. And I was trying to backpedal as fast as I could with, so I would not get hit by the, the tail. And at the time, I didn't know if it was actually the water, the force of the water that was hitting my face or if it was actually the whale. Um, it turned out to be just the water. But I think that it's also important to, to realize that, you know, especially the calves, you know, they're, they're just babies and, and they, they probably don't have maybe a good proprioception of, of how close, you know, you are to them. And so you, you really need to like be careful of that. Um, but this was a really amazing experience. And um, I'm hoping to, um, to get back in the water with the whales again, um, hopefully next year. So those are my two shots um, from the Morea humpback. And then the next shot that I have is totally switching gears. Um, so the other type of image that I really, really just enjoy taking are split shots. Um, I especially like to pair sharks with sunsets because I think it's important that, you know, images be used for, for conservation and to raise awareness for added protections for these animals. And I think that, you know, when you're trying to connect these animals with people in the public, especially people who aren't divers, that you know, most people, who doesn't like a sunset, right? So when you show sharks in this kind of new light and this sort of pleasing light with the sunset, you know, it's, it, show, it, it portrays a positive image with, with the animal. Um, so this picture was actually taken back in 2016 when I was just kind of starting out. And um, it was actually kind of a, a funny story because I basically stole away to Morea for a very short three-day trip by myself. Um, my purpose was to go and to get in the water with the whales. And when I got there, I, I honestly didn't know what I was doing. I just went out on a group sort of day boat with this you know, whole group of people. And there were no professional photographers. Um, it was a lot of people with GoPros or just nothing at all. And the experience was not good. In fact, it was so negative that I just decided, you know what, I've got two days left and I think I'd rather spend my time with the sharks and you know, come back the next year and, and do the whales you know, better, which turned out to be the 2017 trip um, with Ron. 
and getting that shot with the with the cap with the bubble. So that all worked out. Um, so I decided to focus on the sharks and I really wanted to get some split shots of them during the day and also um, for the sunset. And so with this shot here, um, you know, for the sunset, the what I'm really doing is exposing the um, the camera for the sunset and then using the flash to illuminate what's underwater, which in this case is several sharks. Um, and so the first thing to kind of keep in mind is that, you know, with the sunset, you have a very limited window, you know, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. And within that window, there's really only five minutes, in my opinion, of really, really, really good top-notch light. And that's the five minutes before the sun hits the horizon and when the sun actually hits the horizon. Um, so my technique is that I pretty much keep my f-stop really narrow at f18, f20, to keep everything sharp in the foreground and in the background. Um, I like to shoot with high shutter speeds. Um, it's actually a tip that I picked up from Amanda Cotton. And then I expose for the sunset. So within that five minute window, it's usually an ISO of four to 500. This was shot at 500. Um, and the strobes are actually dialed up pretty high. So one of the um, challenges with that is that you don't get the repetitive firing that you get with them on a lower power. So you can't take as many shots. Um, but honestly, you know, before I actually got a good professional camera, which was in 2016, I was shooting with just a little compact camera for several years, um, which had a very slow <laughs> sort of shutter and, and also recycle time. So I think that really taught me kind of the optimal time to actually take a shot. So I actually prefer to take fewer shots. It's actually easier when you go through it on the computer to not have to go through like, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shots from, from one day. Um, so that's kind of like my style with, with this type of shot. And this was also shot with um, the 16 to 35 lens um, at 16. Uh, so then the last shot that I have is this one here. This is called Shark Skylight. This was taken in August of 2020. And this was um, the image that was the overall winner for the underwater photographer of the year for last year for 2021. I took this picture in August of 2020. So this was when not a lot of people were traveling, not a lot of places were open. In fact, French Polynesia had just opened the month before. So I went there with my family for about two weeks and we weren't even sure when we got there if it was gonna stay open. And so I really wanted to try to, you know, maximize the time that I had there because I hadn't been diving a lot, it hadn't been shooting a lot. And I really wanted to, to try to be creative and get something different. And this kind of comes back to another quote that actually almost shared with me on the Cuba trip. And that's something it was, I don't know if this is exact words, but it's that you don't take a picture, you make a picture. You know, you really have to kind of think about it. And so instead of doing my traditional split shot, which I had been doing for, for several years, I would get the sunset through Snell's window and have the entire shot be underwater. And, you know, I had to really think about the lens that I was going to use as well ahead of time. And I knew that the 16 to 35 wasn't going to be wide enough to get the Snell's window with the sunset and to get multiple sharks. And I also knew that, this is another tip that I picked up from Amos, was that the fisheye would probably not be the ideal lens because this is a very shallow location. Depending upon the tide, it's three to five feet deep and it's a sandy bottom. So when you shoot with a fisheye, the sandy bottom ends up looking like the bottom of a boomerang <laughs> and then the sharks look distorted. Um, and so to stay away from the distortion, I wanted to go with a rectilinear lens. And so I ended up going with the, I shoot with Canon. So it's the Canon EF 11 to 24. And that's pretty much the widest, you know, rectilinear lens that you can slap on a DSLR. And what's interesting is that it has very mixed reviews for underwater use. Um, and so I, I experimented with the lens beforehand and, and realized that, you know, it open apertures, it, it was not very sharp, not ideal for underwater photography, but at narrow and small apertures, it was actually very sharp. So this was shot at F20. And, um, you know, the sun has not yet hit, hit the, right, the horizon. Um, so the ISO is 400 and the shutter speed was also one over 200. And this was shot at 12 millimeters. So this was definitely, um, you know, would have not fit because this is not cropped much at all, like maybe like 15% or so. 
So this wouldn't have fit in the 16 to 35 lens. And like if I had used the fisheye, um, it would have had that distorted look to it. So I also really appreciate that tip that uh, almost gave me on lenses. And, you know, I think like maybe one of the other things that I'd like to share is, you know, these kinds of pictures, you really have to have patience. Um, you've got to have time in the water, experience with the animals, and, you know, also a little bit of luck because sometimes the conditions, you know, don't go your way. You know, the sunset isn't very colorful or it's windy and the water's choppy or the visibility is bad or, you know, the, the animals, you know, are just not, in, in sort of a good composition. Um, so definitely, you know, you need to like almost mention about like giving yourself, you know, you know, not just like five or seven days, but to give yourself several weeks. So this is a destination that I've, you know, returned to year after year, you have a lot of experience with, and it's, it's, it's definitely, I think, something that you need to, to give yourself time in the water, you know, to get kind of the more creative types of shots. Um, but I really enjoy taking photographs um, um, near the surface and working with the reflections and with the above and below shots. Um, so that's all I have. Um, I hope that the timing on that was okay. It's all good. I think we can we can overrun by a bit, no worries. <laughs> yeah, because we, we have Jason. I would like to look, I think the audience and um, all of us would like to hear what uh, Jason has to present and he, We'd like, I'd like to hear from his experience as well. So uh, without, without, without more, uh, Jason, please. And then we'll end off with some um, question and answer. Okay. Um, I won't talk too much about myself um, as we don't have that much time and it's not that interesting anyway. But just uh, very shortly, I've uh, been with a company, Scuba Zoo, which I helped create 26 years ago here in Borneo. Um, and over those 26 years, I've worked as a cameraman for the first decade and as a photographer for the second decade. I'd say the last sort of five years or so, um, I've been working a lot more on productions, but still doing photography. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, you know, photography is, is my passion. Uh, filming, as Diego knows now, pays the bills. Uh, photography doesn't pay the bills so much anymore um but uh, yeah if we can have it's the first picture up uh the first picture is uh, my sort of real passion project uh, which is a leatherback turtle um uh, and you know one thing i would say um uh, is is to look for subjects that are close to home uh, and also different subjects and locations. You know, a lot of people in underwater photography now, and you see this on Instagram, are, are chasing the same subjects, the same pictures. Uh, you know, Amos has uh, done a fantastic job of making a lot of these locations famous for the, the leopard seals and the orcas. And, uh, you know, now everybody wants to replicate those pictures. Um, but there's, there's lots more other locations and, and subjects that are out there. You've just got to do your research. And I think one thing that COVID has taught a lot of people in the last couple of years is to explore your own backyard uh, because there's a lot more there to be found than, than, you know, you don't have to cross the entire planet just to get a picture of an orca that everybody else has. Um, so, so this uh, image is taken in Indonesia, which is not too far from where I live. It is a remote location. Uh, I was introdu introduced to the location in 2007. And I've been back about five or six times now. I've been trying to go back every year in the last four or five, six years, but COVID put a stop to that. And basically it's a location where leatherbacks come to feed on jellyfish. And through my research, uh, there's a lot of nesting locations nearby. I'm pretty certain that they also uh, are mating. Um, but you know, my ambition is to get photographs of them feeding on jellyfish and also mating, um, which I haven't been fortunate enough to, to capture yet. Um, up until last year, pictures of leatherbacks mating were absolutely zero. Someone got very lucky last year um, and came across a mating pair out on a, a shark trip. And, uh, and also someone got some really nice pictures of 
a leatherback feeding on jellyfish the end of last year as well. So much to my, my jealousy. Um, but I'm going to continue going back to Indonesia, to this location. Um, and, and one of the things I would say, which has probably come evident from, from the other people that are talking, um, you know, do your research. Research and observation and then time in the water is, is paramount um, or time on the boat as you discover when you're shooting big animals, you spend more time on the boat looking for them than in the water. And so uh, keeping yourself preoccupied and being ready when that one moment comes, because you could be on a boat in the middle of the ocean for three weeks and you have one good encounter with a blue whale or a humpback or whatever it is you're trying to capture. You have to be ready uh, to get those pictures that you want to capture. And, you know, a lot of time people switch off you know, they get bored. Uh, you've really got to be ready for that moment. And like Diego was saying, it's it, it can be exciting, it can be fearful. You know, you've got to you've got to be ready at that moment to get the picture that you want. Um, and so this picture of the leatherback was actually at the end of my last trip in Indonesia in this one location, K. Um, and uh, it's not feeding on jellyfish, which is what I really wanted, but he did have his mouth open. And one of the amazing things about leatherbacks is inside of its mouth is it has these incredible, well, they're not teeth, but it has these, it actually looks like an alien. And so I wanted to try and capture that. This was taken with a fisheye lens uh, and with strobes as well. Uh, you know, when you get into big animal photography, uh, you know, a lot of the time you're shooting ambient light. There's no need for strobes. Uh, but, you know, leatherback isn't quite as big as a humpback or a blue whale, so uh, you can afford to, to light the subject. Um, so, you know, I, it, it's, it's one of the locations that I'm trying to go to every year, and uh, I've got a real passion about leatherbacks as well. We're trying to put together a documentary uh, about the, the Pacific leatherback, which is completely endangered. It will probably go extinct in the next decade uh if things aren't changed um so so you know conservation in mind getting pictures to to make people aware uh, of these subjects is is also paramount as well um if we want to go to the next picture uh i'm not sure which one you're going to show next maybe the humpback um okay are we there yet Humpback. Yeah, humpback. go for the humpback. What a thresher. Thresher's like, okay, humpback. Yes. Um, so, so again, um, yeah, this goes back to, to the whole research thing and, and making the most of, of locations. This was way back, I think, 2007. And as a production company, we're always trying to find new stories and uh, – and pitch ideas to production companies that we can then go and film. And back in 2007, uh, although Tonga was famous for humpbacks or getting well known for humpbacks, nobody had, had actually filmed the heat run. Um, and we had been there the year before and witnessed the heat run, but the guides were very uh, nervous about letting us get in the water. And uh, so finally we pitched an idea to BBC for their series called Life. Um, and, uh, and we went back the following year. We were there for three weeks purely to film the heat run. We were there for three weeks. We had two heat runs in that period of time. But obviously in between, we had a lot of time with humpback mothers and calves, uh, getting footage. And so this, this was a picture of the main cameraman, Roger Munns, filming a, a calf. Um, and one of the things that I really sort of enjoyed about this image was the, the touch it looks like the fin is touching uh, his fin. It's actually not. Uh, he's in the foreground a little bit, but it looks like that sort of high-fiving. And, and, and one of the things, I, I don't do that much um, sort of modeling photography underwater. A lot of my time is spent taking behind the scenes like this. Um, but, you know, if you can get a, a connection between the animal and the human, uh, it goes a long way in telling a story rather than just someone there filming the animal. And so for me, this, this sort of uh, apparent connection of a high five um, really stood out when I was going through my, my humpback pictures. Um, and, uh, and so 
you know, this was way back. We were there for the heat run. You know, we had told, we had pitched the story and, you know, we were successful in getting the heat run. But whilst we were there, we, we had a lot of other opportunities. Um, so if we go to the, the Thrasher Sharp. Um, and again, this was, uh, go, again, go, just sort of going back to the same theme. And, and, and this is, you know, something that Amos, you know, touched on quite a bit as well. You know, doing your own thing and getting away from the crowds is such a big deal. And, uh, and we heard about Malapasqua and the Thresher Sharks way back, I think it was the year 2000. And I think there was one or maybe two results on the island at the time. And, and one result had sort of come across these Threshers on the, the, the Monad Shoal. And so we shot over there knowing that this would be quite a big thing. And we took uh, uh, Doug Perrine, I uh, was, uh, uh, we'd just done something else with Doug somewhere and uh, and we sort of told him about it and dragged him along and we were trying to do a and again it was a pitch for a documentary and so uh, you know we were sort of one of the first people to to explore Malapasqua and and get pictures of thresher sharks and uh, and so I think my pictures were in Diver magazine in the UK uh, sort of the first time it had been told as a story uh, obviously now everybody goes there uh, everybody has pictures of thresher sharks uh, at the time there was no ban on using strobes so uh, I was fortunate enough to, to use strobes uh, when I first shot the thresher sharks um, now you have to follow the guidelines and, and not use strobes uh, their understanding or their, their thought is that the strobes affect the shark's behavior uh, I have to say, when I shot them with strobes, it made no effect to their behavior whatsoever. But that's a whole debate for another another uh, seminar, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it just goes back to 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 speaking to people. You know, one of the reasons I go to ADEX and these dive shows is to speak to people that run dive results and to try and find new stories, what new new angles that you can um uh, tell stories of the same subjects because a lot of the documentaries that I work on now that, you know, the subjects are the same. It's just a case of little stories and uh, angles that people are telling stories about them. So, um, you know, meeting, meeting people that run resorts or the guides themselves and, and asking them, you, you know, you'll meet a dive guide that dives, you know, dive sites in Lembe every single day of the year. And if you sit down and talk to them, they'll, they'll come out with some really amazing little nuggets about behavior that, uh, that people don't necessarily see. And if you act on that, you know, you'll get pictures that, that other people haven't got. Uh, so, so moving on to the last subject, which is a very common uh, picture nowadays. Um, but this goes back to... So again, to Amos talking about doing big, big animal tours. You know, I did a talk about big animal filming and photography in London uh, when uh, Steve Warren did these really amazing uh, sessions. I think Amos was a speaker at as well, uh, Visions of the Sea. And I did a talk 20 years ago about shooting big animals. And um, 20 years ago, pictures of tiger sharks were not that common. Um, and you put up a picture of, you know, certainly not like this. Um, and, and now everybody has tiger sharks. Everyone goes to Bahamas. Now they're going to the Maldives, to the latest location where people are getting up front and personal with tigers, you know, South Africa, Aliwal Shoals. Um, and so it's really changed. And, and, and Instagram now, you know, you, you open Instagram and underwater pictures, a lot of the same pictures you see, humpbacks, tigers uh even blue whales now you know people are flooding to sri lanka to get those shots um so so one of the things you know i'm not saying don't do that as a photographer because everybody wants to get pictures and and the experiences as well of being in the water with these subjects but um it's you know, you've got to start getting a little bit creative you know in this image it's not super creative it's just slow shutter but it's just trying to add something different um and, and there's there's three things when I shoot subjects and even with the leatherbacks um, and even when shooting blue whales and other subjects, you know, when your first encounter with them, I normally take what you call your stock shots. 
pictures that go in our photo library that you know will sell. Um, and it's your pretty random shots. You know, everything's in focus. Uh, it's framed nicely or as nicely as you can get it, but it, it's basically the subject and it's an image that can, can probably sell. Um, so first of all, I would concentrate on those pictures. Um, secondly, I would then move on to creative. And that's when you start playing with your shutter speeds, your strobes, um, and still quite safe techniques. Um, but just adding some creativity to your images. And this is if you get the opportunity, you know, with a blue wow trip or, um, you know, the leatherbacks, you, know, you might only get one really amazing encounter. But if you're going to get two, three, four, five different encounters, then start changing your settings and start trying to get some creativity. And then thirdly, what I would go to is your crazy pictures. Um, and this is where you just, you know, throw everything out, all the rules, rules of thirds and everything else to go out the window and you just get crazy. Um, and also just shooting uh, a very technical term, uh, shoot the shit out of it, uh, <laughs> is, is one of the things I would say if you're having very few encounters because, um, and I learned this of a, of a Nat Geo photographer, is sometimes when you are shooting uh, multiple frames with strobes, it's the pictures in between uh, when your strobes haven't recycled properly or one strobe has cycled, but the other one hasn't, that when you're going through your pictures in Lightroom, you suddenly come across a picture that you would never have planned for. And it's because of these crazy scenarios uh, that there's this image that just looks kind of wacky, but will be completely different to everybody else because everybody else is playing in the safe box, shooting those standard pictures. Um, and, and it might be that image that stands out and it might be because one stroke hasn't recycled. Uh, and so you're, you've you know, heavily lit it on one side that you might not have normally have done because everyone's trying to get that balanced lighting. Um, so, so yeah, you know, I, uh, I understand what Rene is saying about not having so many pictures to go through in the evening. Um, but this one particular in that geo photographer had an assistant to go through his images and he had about 3000 pictures a day, uh, to go through. Um, and, uh, but he also has won wildlife photographer of the year more, <laughs> more times than I know. So, uh, so there, there's a lot to be said about that technical term. I won't repeat it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, I think uh, that you know, it sort of sums up, you know, if I could just sum up, you know, going back over some of the things, um, you know, research, uh, know your subject, observe it, time in the water, um, and then, you know, the different techniques of shoot, shooting the picture, your stock shots, your creative shots, your create crazy shots. Uh, and then the last thing I would say uh, to finish the talk is um, enjoy the experience. Uh, as photographers, as cameramen, we've always got this big box in front of us, between us and the subject. And uh, it's very, very extremely difficult to do. But every now and then, just lower that box and, uh, and enjoy the moment. Because uh, there's so many times I've come back from trips and people have asked me what the encounter was like with a blue whale. And I show pictures because I'm caught up in the moment of taking the pictures, actually experiencing the encounter hasn't happened. Um, and so I would say, you know, try and experience and take it in a lot more than just taking the pictures. Um, so uh, hopefully that sort of kept it short and sweet. Um, and uh, if you want to go on to questions and answers and discussions, Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, Jason, thanks a lot for your presentation and all the awesome picture. I have a, one or two questions to all the panelists. Is it important to study or know prior to the animal behavior before embarking on framing that awesome picture? So for example, I elaborate. So you know how, how some picture like from Rene that 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 humpback it's like dancing and like singing, like having an opera underwater, you know, like 
like this. It, it, it looks how I this how how I read and how I decipher the picture is that that whale is actually doing a uh opera singing underwater. That's how I read it. I mean, others might read it differently. That so that's how I read it. And for Jason, uh, the 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 photo that you mentioned, the diver is um the fin is actually touching the other fin of the the the, the fish. So it's, it's it's not actually touching, right? Um, it, yeah. So how do you know? The depth, like you know, uh, you know, calculation, the depth of view, and then it's just maybe it's not touching, but you can frame it in such a way that you know you prepare you are preparing the animal to do that, and then you frame the the, the subject, the human frame it. So this I, I believe is not about luck. I believe it's about um timing and experience as well. Um, can any of the panelists share more yeah. I, I think you create there's, there's a great saying about creating your own luck um yeah. obviously there's certain things that happen that you cannot uh plan for uh you know i i, I was shooting roger filming the humpback calf the calf was really playful uh and i'll be completely honest i didn't know that that looked like it was touching until i was going through the pictures in the evening uh, you know, I was shooting and shooting and shooting. And then when I was going through the pictures, that image just stood out. I was like, wow, it looked, you know, but I, yeah, I'll be honest. It's, I, I shot it without realizing. Um, but, but going back to like researching locations, researching animals and researching pictures that are already out there uh, and the time in the water, that's what creates your luck. Because if you're not in the water, you'll never get the picture. You've got to be in the water. You've got to be in the locations. Um, I have, just quickly, I have um, quite, I don't know if it's an unusual technique as well, is before a lot of my trips, I will research pictures online, what people have of that subject um, and get inspiration. And what I have is a little sketchbook, which has like rectangles, four by three. Uh, and I sketch ideas of images that I want to capture. So that when I go somewhere, especially if I'm with a guide, I'll say, to, I'll show him the sketches and say, this, this is the sort of thing I want to capture. Is it possible? Where's the best location? What's the best time? And the guide will give you good feedback. And, and also when I did my miniature series with little miniature people, I sketched all those ideas as well. So I, I have a sort of uh, a graphic design background. So that, that sort of comes from that, but, um, so yeah, yeah, that's that's quite different to I guess what other people would do. Yeah, and then Jason, for with the quote about you make your own luck, there's a famous one that I've heard, and that's that luck is when preparation meets opportunity, and I love that quote. <laughs> <laughs> and that's very that's very true. Um, it is about being ready, Jason. You have a similar idea, uh, like uh, what I did before I, before Big Animal was popular. <laughs> the concept in the 90s and um, that's what i was looking at and from there on what images were missing or not been pop not been known and then go out and create them and today since there are so many images like uh, continue looking at uh, how to do things differently than other other the time of the year for an example when planning to go back to chile to do the pumas uh, i shoot also topside not just underwater because we are all photographers here or most everybody goes there during the warm time and the easy time. But the Puma against the snow, it will be the most amazing. And very little and very few images are in a snow time, which is more difficult to get. But the images and the story of the behavior of the animal and all eventually all what we do here. And we need to mention for the people that look at us is all for conservation, for education and supporting the future generation to have the pleasure, like Rene kids, to be able to see them. And they just learn, both of them diving, no, Rene? Your kids. What, oh, I'm sorry, you, what did you say about them? <laughs> Your kids are diving. Oh yeah, they're both diving. Yeah, they're 10 and 14 oh. and they love it. And it's and I'm so happy that they're finally diving, <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> and that's why we do, that's what Liz, I do it. And I believe this Jason and uh, Diego and um, Rene, we do it for conservation and preservation and the joy of being in the wilderness. <laughs> 
absolutely. Nice, nice sharing. I have one more question before we wrap up this session. Um, this this question, I think um, Amos and Diago can actually sh have experience in that from looking at the photo and the video that I share. So how do you actually make the animals be comfortable in front of your lens or yourself or your presence? I mean, that's the most important thing um, to have the subject as a model, even when we take pictures of human, uh, we have to make that human subject be comfortable in front of that lens. So how do you actually make the, that big animal be comfortable? Do you do you uh, feed them food or do you try to uh, use some sand or things like that? I mean, yeah, any experience that you can share? Yeah, we'll go ahead first. Wow, I mean, it's, it really depends on, on the animals. Um, yeah, there's ob obviously for sharks, there's a lot of places where they are feeding the animals and that's, that's really what's happening. Um, and in those cases, it's, it's, I think it's more about, um, you know, following the, the directions of the people who do that on a daily basis, right? Um, and keep, keeping safe because those animals are, are keyed in on the food. So it's, that's, you know, it's a really different approach versus like a manta ray um, coming in through a cleaning station. Um, you kind of know that you, you should stay low, give it its space, and, and nine times out of 10, it's gonna to come to you. Um, and, which actually, as an aside, I thought it was really interesting because it was the, the humpback being attracted to the bubbles, it seemed. And mantas, you know, kind of notoriously always seem to be attracted to bubbles, divers bubbles. So, you know, so oftentimes, point being that animals do come to you, um, they're curious. And so it's just a matter of really just being calm not the sudden movements. And, um, and yeah, like everyone is saying, um, it always helps to know a little bit about those animals, like a, a mola mola in Bali, for instance, you know not to <clears throat> approach it directly, you know not to, to stand sort of upright and, 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 and to emphasize your size by, by sh you know, showing it this, this way. So you, you sort of remain flat and you approach it really cautiously. So there's all sorts of different um, little techniques that you learn over the years um, of what to do. Polar bears, I have no idea. Amos. <laughs> Maybe Amos can uh, share more about polar bears. How do you get them comfortable? Well, I mean, every, they, they do, they tend to get aggressive, right? I mean. Well, yes, yes and no. Every animal have their own behavior. And it is up to us to have the intelligence, to have the patience and the mind, how to relate to the moment. The problem in the West or the challenge in the West, time is money. So we push many times ourselves to do things which are against conservation or against, the, against the, how do you call it, the right things to do in nature. The Eastern philosophy is different. It is you let time do yourself and spend a lot of time with the animal. I learned that in a long time ago. And therefore, why I still don't only work for myself, I don't work for anybody else. It is I take my time. I don't push the animal. I don't have a budget. I don't have a time limit. Yes, and every trip has to be designed. But when I go on my own, when I do the research, I spend the time that needed in order to get the, re to get the animal behavior and to understand it. Um, and then, you'll be able to bring it more into more uh, manageable, uh, react, manageable result. The same thing happened with the polar bear. In the polar bear, again, the idea was most big animal will be like the shark or the or crocodile. I dive with a crocodile also in Botswana, the Nile crocodile versus the one in, 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 uh, <laughs> in Cuba or in uh, Mexico, the Nile crocodile. The, the, Always the idea that we have to understand, first of all, the number of people in the water. We all go work with one or two people the most. And always being not being in front of the animal, wait for the animal to come toward you. And understanding one very important thing that when danger show up, it is too late. That means that mistake was made. We need to know when to ex exit the situation because, withdraw because withdrawal 
is not a defeat. Withdrawal is opportunity to understand what we did, not we did right, to do second time and to do it better. So it is time and money or just time and learn from the time and spend the money to get the best result. And most people don't have it. And that's why they depend on Rene or on Diego or Jason or me to take us, to take them to the water and to the environment and to watch them and to tell them where to stop and where to go back. Because it's not always about the picture, it's more importantly about the human experience and learn what we can do or what we cannot do. It is not about just getting the picture. It is wilderness, it's bigger than all of us. It is, is a wildlife and we cannot force ourselves into the situation. We let it open in front of us, like it happened with Rene or what happened with Jason when he saw the, the, the turtle or with Rene with the humpback. She was ready with the camera and she put herself in the water. You have to be in it to win it. And then the humpback well did what the humpback well did. Or this turtle opened its mouth when Jason was in the front of it and got the picture. It is about really being prepared and be ready, but be fully um, connected with the environment at the moment. All right, thank you for yeah, all the panelists. There is no formula, there's no formula to success, but doing what you like and do it again and again till eventually it happens. Right, so it's all about time, money and effort and the preparation. Thank you, Amos, for, for the sharing. Um, any more to add before we, we end off this panel? I want any to thank everybody. I want to thank everybody. First of all, call it big animal. <laughs> yeah. That's the name of the game. And um, for meeting uh, Diego and uh, see Rene again and Jason that we've seen him so long ago out in, um, <laughs> in, in um, Sri Lanka. <laughs> Yeah, so wonderful. Thank you very much for, for, for John Ted putting all this together. Yep, yep, thank you, thanks. And I hope to see everyone at ADEX physically this year, Absolutely. if not next year. But um, I think the, the traveling will be restarting soon. So yeah. let's be prepared and um, I hope to catch up with everyone again, personally, like physically. <laughs> yeah, awesome. That would be, so That'd be awesome. nice. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for all your sharing. Thank you, panelists, speakers, Thank and you. all your great contribution of your work. Yeah. So uh, thanks for your time today, and um, I'll see you next time around. Thanks. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Yes. See you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Okay.